Hello, BookTube. I've got another poem to read you today on a very bright, very hot day, a very hot Friday. 90 degrees, maybe even a smidge more than that, and the weekend itself, Saturday and Sunday, whew, they're looking to be closer to 100 degrees Fahrenheit than 90 degrees Fahrenheit, after which a tiny drop, imperceptible, uh, but followed by, as far as I can tell, 10 straight days of 90 degree days. So. Uh, not a day to be overexerting, <laughs> not, a, not a day for long, rambunctious dog walks. And believe me, there's someone here who notices that and doesn't like it. Nothing I can do about it. Part of being a parent is that occasionally you are the bad guy. <laughs> but, uh, but I have a poem for you. It's from the, the good old days when we could walk about and I encounter books in little free libraries. <laughs> I encountered this thing in a little free library with a John F. Kennedy uh, dust jacket. <clears throat> but it's a 1930s book. It's called The New Poetry. It's an anthology called The New Poetry, which ironically enough now has only old poetry in it. Uh, and I've been having a blast just exploring in here. And we've been exploring together because I've been reading you a lot of poems from this book. Uh, you'll have to pardon the background humming. I don't know how audible it is. I've, I've noticed that the, the speakers on, on this camera are pretty good at making the distinction between what's up close and talking to it and what's in the background and not. Uh, but nevertheless, there is no way whatsoever, not for myself, there is no way whatsoever, for Frida's sake, that I could turn off the AC unit right now. <laughs> no way. In no more than 10 minutes, this would be an, an oven. So I wouldn't mind at all. I feel, I feel that weird discrepancy because when we're out and about, she is very quickly falling apart into just blast furnace panting and really kind of listlessness, so, type of things that aren't just a hot dog, they're, they're alarming to see. Uh, whereas I am feeling so good. <laughs> well, the, during that same walk at that same time, I'm feeling so good. At last, not cold at all. Anywhere. Not my feet, not my fingers, not anywhere. Uh, but she comes first. <laughs> so uh, we're, we're going to read today a poet called Grace Fallow Norton, uh, who was published... Uh, there's my Sleep read. Uh, it was published in uh, major journals. It was well known as a poet. Who was praised as a poet by, by pretty much all the major poets of her day. Praised her work. Robert Frost certainly did, but there are a bunch of others who did as well. Um, and is completely gone now. <laughs> completely forgotten, as are most of the people that I'm reading you from. And we're gonna. There are a number of her poems in here. I think the editors probably liked her, but we're going to read. Uh, a poem called Make No Vows. I made a vow once, one only. I was young and I was lonely. When I grew strong, I said, this vow is too narrow for me now. Who am I to be bound by old oaths? I will change them as I change my clothes. But that ancient outworn vow was like fetters upon me now. It was hard to break, hard to break, hard to shake from me hard to shake. I broke it by day, but it closed upon me at night. He is not free who is free only in the sunlight. He is not free who bears fetters in his dreams, nor he who laughs only by dark, dream-fed streams. Oh, it costs much bright coin of strength to live. Watch then where all your strength you give. For I, who would be so wild and wondrous now, must give, give, to break a burdening, bitter vow. Uh, we don't ever know, of course, from the context of the poem, what the vow is. We know it's the kind of thing that a young person would say, but we have no idea what that means. Is it love? Are you are you fettered now to a loved one that you where your heart has gone cold? We don't know. We're not told. Instead, it's a poem of regret, a general poem of regret. It has one weak spot that that forced a line between oaths and clothes, uh, but otherwise is technically just spot on, and anachronistic, not only because uh, it has a formal rhyme scheme with that daring uh, repetition, those two lines of repetition in the middle, hard to break, hard to break, hard to shake for me, hard to shake. Very good, very effective for it to happen right in the middle of the poem, the exact center of the poem. Uh, it's outdated not only because it has that, and modern poetry doesn't do any of that. Modern poets don't 
indulge in anything that requires technical expertise because they don't have any. So it's perfectly okay if they, if they fart random words all over a page and then say that that is a legitimate way to write poetry because then they're a poet. Then, you know, a, a rhesus monkey scribbling on a board in the backyard would be a poet. If you say, as everyone did up until the Beats, that poetry involves technical expertise, a technical proficiency in the warping and woofing of lines and the choosing of rhythm and in the mastering of rhyme, well, then you can fail. And every poet alive today would fail very badly because none of them have been taught any of that. Uh, it, but this poem is anachronistic not only in that way, but also in the central theme, the central conceit of the whole poem is that vows fetter you, that it's hard to shake them or almost impossible. Obviously, the narrator of this poem uh, has not shaken that vow. Uh, and that's anachronistic too, because no one makes vows anymore, nor keeps them. People, uh, uh, in the 21st century, the idea of a, a vow being inviolate, of your word being your bond, is laughable. It literally will get you laughed at on social media. It, it literally will get you laughed at as, as an unbelievably stupid and antiquated idea. Uh, not just politicians who lie as a genus, but also everybody else. Just, I know I said this, but I'm not going to do it. I'm just going to ignore that I ever said one thing and did another. Uh, so, a chestnut, uh, in other words, unfortunately. And the same is true of the other poems as well. There's one here called Allegra Agonistes, presupposing, by the same poet, by Grace Fallow Norton, presupposing, at least, that you are familiar with uh, Milton. It, it presupposes that at least, and no one is, no one reads Milton anymore. You would, it, this, the poem Allegra Agonistes assumes that you are familiar, that you have read, maybe even that you have studied Samson Agonistes, and you haven't. <laughs> no one's even heard of it. So, uh, it, Mary, uh, Grace Fallow Norton is a chestnut author, unfortunately. Uh, and led a, a fascinating life, saw combat up close, uh, not as a soldier, but definitely wanting to see it with her own eyes, led a fascinating personal life, and once again, you could recite the refrain with me now, word for word, her vast collection of documents, I believe, is all in one place, in unvisited boxes. No one thinks to write a book about her, nor to write uh, a smaller piece. Uh, a number of you have emailed me, especially after yesterday's uh, daily poetry reading, a number of you emailed me and said, uh, you know, you're fascinated by these people, but absent a really good historical imagination on the part of an author, who could write a 300-page book on these vanished figures and make it interesting? First of all, I think someone could. I, it, it, I don't put any limits on what writers can do, even in the 21st century. But... One of you pointed out another project, something that would work, which is for someone to do a Plutarch's Lives, or even an Aubrey's Brief Lives, of all of these vanished poets. So you're not writing a 300-page book. Instead, you're writing 30 pages, 30 really good pages where you don't phone anything. And of course, there's nothing to phone in here. No one's ever written anything on these poets. So you would have to go and visit those archives. You would have to go and sit, make an appointment, wear your mask, and sit with those documents, sift through them. Each one of the lives in that volume would take a long time. You would have to shag all over the country, sometimes other countries, in order to find these primary documents, in order to write 30-page lives that would be really good. What a project that would be. Good Lord. The end result... Uh, I, the end result would be amazing. People would love it. I bet it would be a quirky... Uh, idiosyncratic hit. Uh, if it was backed by original research, and if the writer was really good, make it 400 pages, maybe 500, call it the poets of our youth. You could start with half the figures in this volume. <laughs> anyway, I, I dream of books that never were. <laughs> so, to, to quote A. Kennedy, if not this Kennedy. Uh, but anyway, I'm gonna, that's your poem for today. It's not hot enough to stop me from reading you poetry. Uh, but I'm going to wrap this up for now, and I'll be back. Thank you, Booktube.